We began this morning a short series which will take us through this Sunday and next of four sermons on the Bible. I explained this morning that probably the proper context of that is that we are involved in our own church nationally and in its General Assembly particularly with controversy and confusion and difficulties, most of which arise from controversy over the central issue of where our authority properly lies in the church of Jesus Christ more generally and particularly in the lives of individual Christian people. We began this morning by turning to Isaiah 55 where we trace the relationship of God the Father to the Bible. And it is my intention this evening and next Sunday morning to continue that series by considering this evening the relation of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Bible and next Sunday morning the relation of the Holy Spirit to the Bible. There is no question whatever that the nature of the authority of Scripture is closely tied in with the significance of the three persons of the Trinity. And so this evening we turn to John chapter 5 where it would be helpful for you to have your Bible open and to this passage which begins at verse 31. It may not be the most obvious place in the Bible to turn to for this teaching, but I hope that we may discover this evening that it does focus upon precisely the, this particular subject. One of the themes that we found ourselves touching upon this morning as we thought from Isaiah 55 about the relation of God the Father to the Bible was the theme of authority. Now, there are many reasons that people put their lives under the authority of Holy Scripture and believe it and accept it as God's written Word. In some cases, it may simply be its inner consistency, the obvious testimony of Holy Scripture about itself. And there is a testimony which the Bible gives to us about itself which is overwhelmingly convincing once you have examined it. It may be that it is the testimony of the power that Holy Scripture exerts over people's lives. And that has been a reason for many to bow themselves before its authority, but chief among them must surely be this reason, that when we discover Jesus Christ himself endorsing the authority of Holy Scripture for his own life and ministry, and in a wider sense for the lives of God's people, then if we find that he, who, if we are Christian men and women, is our Lord as well as our Savior, if he accepted the authority of Scripture, then his authority and the authority of Scripture must be seen to stand or fall together. That's a very important thing. When you have really examined the truth about this in the New Testament, you discover that it is not open to us to say, Oh yes, I gladly accept Jesus Christ and his lordship and seek to live under it, but this particular view of Holy Scripture, I cannot find myself accepting. Because if we are living under the lordship of Jesus Christ, we will live under his lordship in relation to Scripture as well as to everything else. And if Jesus endorses the authority of Scripture, 
exemplifies a life that is lived under its authority, then we ourselves will be followers of Jesus in this as in every other area of our lives. I want then this evening to look very simply at the relation of Jesus, the Son of God, to Scripture, particularly in this passage in John 5, especially in the words of verses 39 and 40, but they within the wider context of verses 31 to the end. 39 and 40 read in Jesus' uh, controversy with the Pharisees. Uh, you have, he says, you diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the Scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Now, the two things that I want to focus our attention on this evening are these. First, that Scripture testifies to Jesus. That's the more obvious of the two. Scripture testifies to Jesus. The other is that Jesus testifies to Scripture. That is perhaps not immediately obvious, but I hope it will become so as we proceed. And these two things together really provide for us the significance of the relation between the Son of God and the Word of God as it is written in Holy Scripture. First, the Scripture testifies to Christ, and secondly, Christ testifies to Scripture. Well, let's turn to the first of these. It is summarized, of course, in verse 39, where Jesus in the last sentence of that verse says, these are the Scriptures that testify about me. Now, that is a general truth in the New Testament that the central function of the whole Bible is to bear testimony to Jesus Christ. He is its central theme. Just look down, for example, to verse 46 of this passage, and you will see these four words about Moses that Jesus speaks to the Jews. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. That could refer to Moses' prophecy about the Lord sending a prophet like him, which he makes in Deuteronomy chapter 18. But more likely, what Jesus is saying is that in the five books of Moses, the key to understanding what Moses wrote is that Jesus is the one of whom Moses is speaking. And there is no question that as you go through the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the key to understanding them, without which you land in great confusion about their ultimate meaning, is that they have as their theme Jesus. Now, he is not only the theme of the law, he is the theme also of that second part of the Bible called the writings, chief among which are the Psalms. And when you begin to study the Psalms, what you discover is that they bear testimony to Jesus. If there is ever a place where it's manifest that the Bible is bearing witness to Jesus Christ, it is in the Psalms. He himself quotes again and again of how the Psalms speak about him. The rest of the New Testament uses the Psalms, particularly in the book of Acts, to bear testimony to Jesus Christ and who he is. He is, in a very special sense, of course, the theme of the prophets. 
He is Isaiah's suffering servant. He is Daniel's son of man. He is great David's greater son and God's eternal king. He is the great high priest who is figured in the Old Testament scripture and fulfilled in Jesus. And certainly, this is how Jesus himself sees the whole of Scripture. You will remember how in Luke chapter 24, he leads these two disciples he meets on the Emmaus Road, and then the eleven whom he visits in Jerusalem through the whole of these three sections of the Bible, the law, the prophets, and the writings, in order to show them in all the Scripture the things concerning himself. You recollect how Jesus does this when he is on the road to Emmaus and upbraids these two men who are fearful and disappointed. They had hoped that Jesus might have been the Messiah, and he says in Luke 24, 25, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things? and then enter his glory. Now notice where he begins. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now that's not just what Jesus says to the two men. Notice what happens when he returns to the eleven. In chapter chapter 24, verse 44, He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. Now notice where. In the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. And he told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Now, the main great witness of the Bible, therefore, is to Jesus. And this is its central theme. Now, the other way in which this is true is that Jesus almost universally finds the significance of his mission in the fulfillment of Scripture. Again and again he explains why it is that he is doing a particular thing by saying this must be that the Scripture might be fulfilled which says of me, and then he quotes from some area of the Old Testament. And when he is being arrested in the garden, in Matthew 26 at verse 53, Peter tries to avoid what is happening to him, and Jesus answers in a very significant way, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father? And he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels. In other words, it would be possible for God the Father to intervene and save him from this dreadful suffering and death. But, says Jesus, now here is the fulcrum on which everything turns for Christ. But, he says, how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so. What is he saying? He is saying, the Scriptures bear testimony to me. Now, in every area of Holy Scripture, this is what we discover. The Scriptures bear witness to who he is in the essence of his person. The Scriptures bear witness to the content of his teaching. The things he teaches, he says, are not my own. They are the words my Father has given me. And this he said to fulfill what was written by the prophet and so on. The scriptures bear testimony to the purpose of his mission, to the nature of his death, 
to the fact of his resurrection, to the promise of his return, there is no area of our Lord's life and indeed no area of Scripture which does not fit into this central category that it is a testimony to Jesus. But the other side of this truth is at least as important, and that is that if Scripture witnesses to Christ, the other side of the truth is that Christ witnesses to Scripture. Now let me show you how that is so here in John chapter 5. The context of these words that lie at the heart of it in verses 39 and 40 teach us that the issue that Jesus is dealing with is how the testimony that Jesus has given may be validated. There are several stages of the argument that Jesus goes through, and it's important to follow it and see exactly what it is that Jesus is saying. He acknowledges first in verse 31 that his own testimony would be inadequate. Verse 31 says, If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. And that, of course, was part of the law of corroborative evidence, which Jesus clearly here is subscribing to in order to convince the Jews, not that in any sense his uh, testimony is untrue because he says in chapter 8, verse 14, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. But he is acknowledging what is now part of our legal system and derived from Jewish law and then came into Roman law that there was a need for corroborative evidence. You will know how in our own legal system today we have taken that into our legal arrangements that corroborative evidence is a vital part of conviction. Now that arises from the Old Testament principle that there needed to be a testimony in the mouths of two or three witnesses. Now Jesus is acknowledging this in verse 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. But then he goes on in verse 32 to say in the second place that in fact his testimony is not alone or isolated, for God the Father testifies concerning him. Verse 32, there is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. Now that's the testimony of God the Father. You will remember it was given in various ways. Perhaps the way we remember most is when God the Father testified at Jesus' baptism and anointing and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But the testimony is the general testimony of God the Father. And in a moment or two, Jesus is going to enlarge on that. In the third place, in verses 33 to 35, he tells us that John the Baptist bore testimony to him. Now, you will remember how that happened. John the Baptist testified to Jesus, saying, Here is the Lamb of God. He points to him and says, This is the one of whom I have been speaking. He is God's Son and God's Lamb. But, says Jesus, I do not accept human testimony. Verse 34. Now, of course, everybody else would have accepted human testimony. John the Baptist's evidence would have been corroborative evidence. But Jesus says, do not go on human testimony for this. We need not human testimony, but what kind of testimony? Divine testimony, obviously. So he goes on in the fourth place in verses 36 to 40 to tell us that the weighty testimony the overwhelming, convincing testimony 
is that which God the Father has given, and he has given it in two places. First, he has given it in verse 36, in the work that Christ performs. For the very work the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. But then there is another testimony that God the Father gives, verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. Now, how does he testify in the second place? Not just by the work he gave Christ to do, but notice, you have never heard his voice nor seen his form nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent, and not believing the one he sent, they don't believe his word, and his word does not dwell in them. You diligently study the scriptures. Now, where then is this word that God has spoken found? And Jesus' answer is, it is found in the Scriptures. Now, the Pharisees had the Scriptures, of course. Why then were they not overwhelmingly convinced from the testimony of Scripture about Jesus? Now, here's a very important thing. They misused the Bible. Notice how they did it, Jesus says, you diligently study the Scriptures. Ah, isn't that extraordinary? How can they be misusing the Word of God if they diligently study it? Surely that's the thing that I'm trying to plead with people to do. Diligently study the Scripture. But you notice... They have done the very thing that we have spent some time this evening seeking to avoid. That is, they have divided between Holy Scripture and the one to whom it testifies, who is Jesus. Now, my dear friends, the thing you must never, never, never do is divide between Holy Scripture and the one it testifies to, who is Jesus Christ. So you may study the Bible with every possible kind of intellectual equipment that you can find until you know it through and through. But if you are not willing to be led to Jesus Christ, if you do not see Christ as its key, then you will discover that the Scripture becomes to you what it became to the Pharisees, and that is a dead letter of a dead law, and not what Augustine called our chariot to lead us to Christ. That's a beautiful phrase of Augustine's. What is Holy Scripture, he asks, it is our chariot to lead us to Christ. That's the whole point of Holy Scripture. Notice Jesus says you diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. But where is eternal life to be found? You and I could have told them, could we not? Eternal life is to be found in Jesus Christ. And the significance of Holy Scripture is that it leads us to Jesus Christ. But you notice that the whole point of Jesus' testimony is the testimony that Holy Scripture is the word that God has spoken concerning his Son. And it is there that Jesus' 
testimony to Scripture focuses. Let me point out to you how exactly Jesus bears testimony to Scripture. We have noticed how Scripture bears testimony to Jesus. How does Jesus then bear testimony to Scripture? Of course, he bows before its authority. He endorses its truth. He tells us not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away until all has been fulfilled. Heaven and earth may pass away, but not the Word of God. And Jesus underlines that for us. And here again, you see, if we are living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we will have His thinking about Scripture becoming our thinking about Scripture. But how particularly does he bear testimony to Holy Scripture? I think in three ways. Let me just mention them to you. First, in his personal conduct. We have noticed how Jesus submitted himself to the promises and prophecies of Scripture and every area of his life and ministry was acted out in fulfillment of Holy Scripture. But there's a more personal way, and I think that perhaps that may be of greater relevance to many of us here in church this evening. It was in his personal conduct that he bore testimony to Holy Scripture. There are so many illustrations of this. Let me extract one. And it is from the experience of Jesus in his temptation in Matthew chapter 4. You're very familiar with it. Scarcely need to look it up. But you remember what happens there. Jesus uses the Scripture. We constantly look back to the temptations and say, here is our Lord showing us how to use Scripture when you're battling with the devil. You take it like a javelin and you hurl it at him. Let him have the Bible. But you know, while that's true, I think there is another side we often miss in the temptation narrative. What exactly do you think was the first application of Scripture that Jesus made? When the devil said to him, for example, command these stones to be made bread, and Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, the first application of that was to himself. It wasn't to the devil. He was the one who was being tempted to take the situation into his own hands and make bread out of stones, perform a miracle for his own ends. And the first application of the Scripture from Deuteronomy was to his own life. I am going to live as a man living in the flesh, I am going to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he proved it there in the wilderness. Here's the second temptation coming. And the devil comes and says to Jesus, go up into this high pinnacle of the temple. And when he gets him there, he says, now throw yourself down because the Scripture says that He will not let you dash your foot against a stone and send angels to take charge of you. And Jesus says, you shall not test the Lord your God. Now, to whom is that applied, first of all? Not to the devil, but to Jesus Himself. It was He who was being tempted to test the Lord and see how far he could go. And Jesus says, 
this settles the matter for me. And in the third case, when he shows him the kingdoms of the world and says to them, all this will be yours if you will fall down and worship me, Jesus says, it is written again, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Now here is the servant par excellence, the Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of Isaiah's servant figure. And he is the one who has an exclusive desire to serve the living God and bow his will before him. To whom was that applied first? Not to the devil, but to Jesus. Now, do you see the principle is that he bears testimony to Holy Scripture in his personal conduct. Satan is seeking to have him live a different way. And Jesus says, it is written, and that's sufficient for him. Now, the great question is, is that sufficient for us? Is this how we live in relation to our personal conduct? The testimony of Jesus Christ is that Scripture is sufficient. He needs nothing other than the Word of God to direct the course of his life. And that, my dear friends, is how we honor Scripture most. We honor Scripture most by obeying it in our personal conduct. Here's the second area. In his understanding of his mission and the fulfillment of the way he served God, he clearly submits himself obediently to the role which he sees described for him in Holy Scripture. So the pattern of his ministry became a pattern of suffering and death which the Scripture foretold. And he says the Son of Man must. So often the Son of Man must do this. Why must? Well, universally, because the Scripture says so. That's the principle. And this is the principle for personal conduct. It's the principle for Christian service as well. And thirdly, it's very significant that it is the secret of how Jesus conducted public controversy. Did you think that Jesus perhaps avoided all controversy, never was a controversial figure? Well, it's not true, of course, because Jesus was engaged in controversy very frequently, especially with the Pharisees, about all sorts of different things. And whenever he was in controversy with the Pharisees, do you notice what his manner and principle is, there would be differences of opinion with the religious leaders of his day. And Jesus' appeal was always the same. He asked them, what is written in the Scripture? How do you read? Or have you not read how it is written, places like Luke 10, 20, Mark 12, 10. It's very interesting that his controversy was chiefly with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees added to Scripture. They added all sorts of minute laws and qualifications to the Scripture. The Sadducees subtracted from Scripture. They took away everything except the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. And it's very significant that Jesus' controversy was with these two groups. They had gone wrong because they were wrong in their attitude to Scripture. For Jesus, what Scripture said, God said. And what Scripture taught, God taught. And therefore his life was not just a life that was submitted gladly to God the Father, I always do what pleases my Father. 
It was a life that was submitted to Holy Scripture. We frequently pray like Jesus, like Jesus, I long to be like Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do you really long to be like Jesus in this? That in every area of your life, you will be submitted to the absolute authority of Holy Scripture. That does not make you inflexible, hard, difficult, cold, clinical, or whatever. What it simply means is that if a brother or sister has some other way of thinking, you will say to them, well now, what I gladly want to do is to sit down with you with the Bible above us both so that we listen to what God's Word has said and it will be the final court of appeal. It's a little bit like having gone through all sorts of different courts, you know, the JP court, the sheriff court, the high court, the court of session, and then the last place of all to which you can make appeal is the house of lords. And you go there and say whatever they say will be the final word. And there is only one ultimate court of appeal for Christian men and women, and it is Holy Scripture. That's the way to freedom. It's the way to joy. It's the way to blessing. And it's the way to living like Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your holy word, for all its truth and all its riches. In your grace, grant that we may not only search it diligently, but live it out obediently and recognize our Savior as its central theme. Make us like him in his love for obedience to your word. We ask it in his name's sake. Amen.